Okay. So today I'm going to speak about something completely different uh, from, uh, from my traditional topics. Um, so first of all, uh, I'm now at a company called Grail. Uh, what do we do? Uh, we basically detect cancer early when it can be cured. So the idea is that cancers, when they're detected early, uh, generally have about an 80% chance of survival. Uh, after stage two or three, that flips, and so you have about a 20% chance of survival. And so we believe that um, the key to solving cancer, one of the keys to solving cancer is early detection. So how do we do that? A ton of data and a ton of data processing. Um, and so uh, Grail's approach is that we sequence cell-free DNA from blood uh, at very high depth. And so this results in about a terabyte of data for you know, a single uh, little tube of blood. Uh, and then we analyze these data to look for signs of cancers. Uh, there's a lot of bioinformatics, uh, a lot of statistics, machine learning, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's the basic gist of, of um, how we go about uh, doing this. So um, bioinformatics is an interesting uh, sort of sub-discipline. Um, and the, the, the general sort of gist of it is uh, it comprises a number of different tools to analyze sequencing data in various ways. And so the sort of classical example is sequence alignment. And I'm not going to go into too much detail. In fact, it's not really needed for this talk. Uh, but sequence alignment is basically uh, a way to kind of reassemble the, the sort of shredded up um, uh, phone book in the uh, tr traditional analogy. Uh, it's a very computationally expensive thing to do, and a lot of bioinformatics is very computationally expensive. It's also highly interdisciplinary, and so there's uh, a lot of application of advanced data structures and algorithms, uh, biology, of course, statistics, mathematics, and so on and so forth. And so it's actually a really, really fun uh, area to work in. So <clears throat> how do these uh, bioinformatics uh, sort of workflows tend to work? Well, first of all, we get raw data from uh, a set of sequencers. So this is where uh, the sort of raw genomic data comes from. Um, and typically after that, they're aligned to some reference. Uh, the reference is sort of a reference human genome, for example, or if you're working in non-human genomes, whatever uh, you know, species that you're dealing with. Uh, and then you tend to do a lot of different analysis uh, on these aligned data. Uh, so everything from you know, quality filtering to trying to uh, detect patterns in the data to trying to build uh, statistical models based on some baseline data to doing quality control, you name it, it's all over the place. So uh, not only do you, uh, so, so this sort of represents what you might do for a single sample. And once you have this sort of baseline data, you might want to, say, apply some, some set of models to it. Uh, so for example, in our case, maybe we want to try to classify whether or not some genetic variant uh, uh, belongs to a, a solid tumor or not, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and other applications, you might want to determine whether or not uh, a particular genomic variant represents a biological variant or a technical artifact, things like that. And so there's a number of different kinds of analysis that you want to do on these, uh, on these data. And then finally, uh, once you have uh, you know, lots and lots and lots of samples uh, where you've applied these different kinds of models, you might want to build classifiers. So in our case, you want to be able to uh, build classifiers that are able to um, basically determine whether or not a particular sample uh, may uh, or may not have evidence of, of cancer. Um, and you can imagine in other research there are very similar kinds of problems. So the, t the sort of typical computing infrastructure that's employed in, in bioinformatics uh, comes from this sort of academic high-performance computing tradition. And uh, the basic gist of it is that you go to a vendor like EMC and Supermicro, and you basically fork them uh, a boatload of, fork over a boatload of money, and they give you a set of expensive com uh, compute nodes, um, and you share data over some shared file system like NFS, uh, and then you might employ some sort of work queue system like SunGrid Engine to schedule work across that cluster, right? And uh, as you can probably tell, that's not a very sort of cloud-friendly way of, of doing things, and it has many other drawbacks as well. For example, uh, you know, it's very, very difficult to um, uh, expand cap capacity on demand. Uh, very little is assumed about uh, the environment of the computation, and so what, tends, what ends up uh, typically happening is that uh, the various pieces of software depends on certain artifacts of the environment, like what Python version is installed across the cluster or whatever. 
Anyway, it's a thoroughly uh, kind of outdated approach to, uh, to computing. Uh, and so, so our goal is to kind of bring this into the modern age. The, uh, the other thing is that uh, usually um, there's, uh, you, usually you apply some sort of workflow framework uh, to manage your, your computation uh, on top of this sort of cluster engine, for example. Um, there's, a, there's a cottage industry of these, and so one, one example is Apache Airflow you might have heard of, uh, but there's, uh, there's a number of others like Luigi and things like that. Most of these are very low level. They require you to construct an explicit graph that uh, declare data dependencies between different nodes in the graph. Each node represents a, a, a computation to do. And they don't assume anything about a data model or a computation model or anything. It's sort of purely, here's a graph, you go execute it. Right? And um, what we found is that, uh, first of all, they're, they're very cumbersome to, uh, to deal with in practice, especially when your workflows become fairly complicated, as I just showed you. Uh, they're very difficult to compose because you tend to kind of bake in assumptions in different modules. It's hard to modularize, in other words. Um, and uh, I think most severely, uh, it, it, in, in, um, in um, uh, Butler Lamson's words, it ties the hands of the implementer, right? Uh, it doesn't give a lot of leverage to somebody providing infrastructure uh, to do interesting things. And, and you'll see what kinds of things we might do if we had that freedom. So here's an example uh, from Apache Airflow, which is a, a popular uh, sort of work use system. Uh, and in this particular example, you can't see the code that's sort of on, on purpose, I guess, because there was too much of it. Uh, but really, this is just invoking the date command in bash and sleep or something like that, tying them together and, and executing them. Um, and you know, this, is all you have, this is what you have to do in order to do that, which seems, uh, seems a little excessive to me. Uh, also. These systems are only involved in the sort of orchestration. Again, they might be able to run certain commands locally, but if you want to distribute your work or parallelize it across multiple machines, again, they make no assumptions about your data model, right? They make no assumptions about your underlying cluster execution. And so you kind of have to uh, fill that in yourself. And of course, people have provided plugins and things like that to make, it, make that simpler, but it's a lot of moving pieces. Uh, and, and, uh, what we saw was something that's sort of closer to what we now call serverless computing, right? Where this infrastructure uh, is something that you don't necessarily have to provide yourself. So uh, this is where Reflow comes in. Um, and uh, this is our system and, and kind of our answer uh, to, to tackle these kinds of problems. So the first basic idea is that uh, we want to get rid of this notion of workflow altogether, right? It's sort of an awkward thing to do. Like what you're really doing is just computing programs. And we're used to having sort of traditional tools and programming that we can apply, like, you know, function application, list comprehensions, data structures, things like that, right? Um, and uh, if you can just, you know, if you can just program these, 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 these things directly, uh, it makes it all the simpler. Um, and uh, there's a number of different features that you can apply once you sort of control your own language that makes it very easy to reason about and gives the runway, uh, sorry, the runtime a lot of leverage. Furthermore, once you control your own language, you can also have a type checker, which is very helpful in these cases because sometimes they run for hours, if not days at a time. Uh, and uh, you want to be able to understand the avoidable errors before they happen, right? So, uh, Another thing that Reflow does is that, uh, again, I've been kind of harking on this, but it defines a, a, a data model. Uh, and that data model is one of referential transparency. And I'll, I'll get to what that means precisely in a second. And the result of that is that it gives the runtime itself a lot of leverage to do very interesting things, as we'll also see. And then finally, uh, what we do, so now we have a language. We have a sort of runtime or a way to interpret um, programs in that language. And now what we want to do is to combine it into a sort of single vertically integrated system that is just sort of transparent. And so you want to have the experience of, say, running a Python script. It's just that instead of running it on your, on your local laptop, it's able to, say, run it on a cluster in EC2, instantiate resources as they're needed, deal with data movement, and so on and so forth. Right? And this is sort of what I mean by, by serverless or cloud native. So what were our, our goals here? Well, first of all, in terms of the, the, the main specific language, uh, and I'll show you lots of examples in, in just a little bit, uh, we wanted a, a sort of simple, statically typed 
uh, functional language. And, and we chose a Go-like syntax simply because that's what we were familiar with. And the, the, the goal, which is uh, you know, somewhat tenuous, is that we wanted to make sure it had just enough power for this kind of workflow computing, but not enough to really be a general purpose programming language. Right? And that's, of course, a hard balance to strike, uh, but I think we managed to do it fairly well. Um, we wanted to be able to express things like compound data structures and compositions, so you know, think familiar things like structs and lists and maps and so on and so forth. Um, again, everything in Reflow is referentially transparent and also lazily evaluated. Uh, and this means that we can, again, write straightforward programs uh, uh, that evaluates in a way that doesn't perform unnecessary work. We also wanted a module system so that we could actually write uh, testable, documentable modules for each of the different parts of these workflows, uh, and then also include a documentation system. So in terms of the runtime, uh, what, we, what we sought was the ability to sort of interpret the programs directly on the cloud. And so when you run a reflow program, uh, if it needs more resources, it should itself instantiate, uh, you know, for example, nodes in EC2, uh, bootstrap them, and, and transport the data and encode or whatever else is needed kind of transparently. Um, the tools themselves that we invoke inside of Reflow, so for example, the aligner and the bioinformatics example I showed earlier, uh, should all be distributed via Docker images. So this gives us a way of packaging up um, an, envi an environment together with binaries. And then we wanted to make sure we could cache all costly reductions. And so what this means is basically everything in Reflow gets memoized, okay, uh, and that means that if you run it again uh, and something's already been computed, uh, it's, it's basically no op, right? And this allows some very interesting properties as we'll see in a second. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that we could distribute evaluation and parallelize it beyond a single node. And so Reflow, the runtime, um, has a work stealing uh, setup that allows it to do that. And so if you write a, a program that could use uh, you know, the parallelism of hundreds of different uh, EC2 instances, uh, it will be able to uh, to actually harness that computation power. And then in terms of usability, it should really just authenticate the user once and bootstrap everything from there. And so from a usability point of view, it really should act like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm running a programming language interpreter. Um, it just so happens to be able to execute this thing on a cloud. Also, we wanted to, to make sure that it was portable. So we could support multiple cloud providers, but also uh, an on-premise computing cluster, as well as running things locally on your laptop. Uh, in our case, if you have a Mac, we'd use Docker for Mac. If Linux, you know, we use Docker there and so on and so forth. So let's show you a little, uh, I'm first going to show a little demo and I'll explain things um, as we see them. Uh, and then I'll go into a little bit more detail uh, about some of the aspects of what you're seeing. So uh, first of all, we start off where, you know, I have some AWS access keys in my environment. Just a standard, standard way you would do things. Uh, you, you, in, you install it. And now we're going to write our sort of hello world uh, reflow program. Uh, I, uh, I guess I, I made a mistake and I changed my mind. You know what? I'm going to abstract something. So I'm going to declare a function called hello. Uh, you pass it a greeting. And what this function is going to do is that it's going to execute inside of uh, the image Ubuntu while reserving 10 megabytes of memory and one CPU, placing its output in a file called out. Um, uh, this, you know. Echo, echo hello greeting, um, and uh, then redirect that to the output file. And so you can see uh, Reflow kind of seamlessly uh, integrates the environment of execution inside of a Docker container with the uh, interpreter environment around it. Uh, the main will simply evaluate that. Now we're going to run it. So what does this do? Well, first of all, um, it'll now determine that actually I don't have any uh, EC2 instances standing by, so I'm launching one. It'll find the instance type that is mo most suitable for my work, um, and it'll even go out on the spot market and make a bid uh, to make um, to allocate spot instances. It now ran this in, um, uh, inside of the Ubuntu image again, uh, and then returned, you know, the the hash of the produced file in this case, right? And so that's how simple it was. And I now, with a few lines of, of code, and literally just typing reflow run. Uh, instantiated a cluster on EC2, run the thing there, uh, and, and gotten the results back. Um, and this is obviously a very, very simple example. I'll show you in a second uh, the kinds of more sophisticated things you can do with this language. And so with that, I'm going to go through a little bit of a code walkthrough. Um, and so 
Uh, one of the most common sort of bioinformatics tasks is to, uh, again, do this sort of sequence alignment where you have raw data coming out of sequencers and you want to align that uh, against a reference. It's a needle in a haystack problem. I have uh, you know, a billion different needles and I have a well-defined haystack and I want to place them precisely. So <clears throat> uh, uh, I also want to show that, um, as I mentioned, Reflow has a documentation system. So uh, in this case, I have a module called align. If I call Reflow doc and align, it'll show me the module's parameters. Uh, its declarations and so forth, as well as uh, the documentation, documentation that's declared. And what you'll see here is that we're dealing with sort of ordinary programming things, right? We have functions and you know, integers and strings and you know, what have you. There's nothing really weird about it, right? It's just straightforward, ordinary programming. So let's look a little bit at what this align module actually does. So first of all, it takes a number of different parameters, right? So there are some metadata parameters that are used to just embed um, you know, metadata in the aligned output. Um, it takes an alignment genome. The alignment genome is the reference that I talked about. Uh, it defines how many threads we want to use for a single instantiation of this alignment and so on and so forth. And again, I'm just using ordinary programming constructs. So for example, here I'm defining a function that uh, takes two files, and so uh, these, this is a sort of technicality, but uh, reads from Illumina sequencers come in pairs. Um, so it takes two files, and then uh, what flow cell and lane those files came from. Flow cell and lane is sort of where in the uh, sequencing um, flow cell uh, particular read came from. And in order to align that, I'm going to execute this BWA mem aligner inside of whatever BWA image I have, uh, reserving 16 cores of CPU and 12 gigabytes of memory. I'm going to place the output in um, a file called SAM, right? And uh, you'll see that I'm doing some interesting things here. So first of all, uh, I'm referring to these files directly inside of what's called an exec here. So this is the code that runs uh, inside of the Docker container here. And when I refer to a file directly inside of an exec, when that actually runs, it's materialized as an on-disk file with a, an effectively random path, so you can't really rely on it. But, you know, it's there. If I have a directory like alignment genome is, it's materialized as a directory, and I can refer to things inside of that directory. Um, I can also interpolate, you know, even arbitrary expressions. So in this case, uh, I'm saying, I'm calling this read group function, which just emits a string that contains sort of the correctly formatted metadata that this aligner expects, okay? And so uh, when, uh, uh, so that's the first thing I do. And then once I have uh, this output, uh, I'm going to call this tool called SAM tools, which converts uh, what's uh, called a SAM format into a BAM format. So it's basically a binary version of the same format. And then finally, I'm going to use a BAM module uh, to sort the aligned data for me, right? Uh, and again, like I'm just writing straightforward code. Like there's nothing really special about that. So uh, now things start to get pretty interesting. So, so I have this, this uh, underscore or um, lowercase align function. So it's sort of a, the workhorse of this module. Um, I'm abstracting that by this uppercase align functions. And so also following Go, um, identifiers that begin in uppercase are exported. Uh, other ones are, are not, right? And so uh, I can call align, this uppercase align, uh, and it has a sort of understandable signature, so given this read pair, uh, give me a, a, a BAM file back. And if the split fast queue um, uh, option is set on the module, it's actually going to split the input file into multiple different chunks, right? And sometimes thousands of different chunks. And uh, align each of those chunks individually, right? And then merge them all together. Now, under the hood, this does something very interesting. Because Reflow has data flow semantics, it's actually able to parallelize all those things at, at, at a given time. And so for you know, really large alignments, uh, I can split this into a thousand different pieces and Reflow will allocate you know, a few hundred machines to work on this for you in parallel, right? Um, and as a user, you don't see that at all, right? It's just, you're, again, writing a straightforward program, that's all it does. So, so, so that gives you kind of a flavor for the kinds of things that you can do inside of Reflow. Uh, I have mentioned that there's a module system, so this align module is, um, you know, basically a module that I use inside, in this case, inside of a sort of top-level uh, module uh, 
uh, where I'm you know, fetching some, some data from a public data set, aligning it, and doing some other things. Right? Um, and so these things compose in expected ways. You can write unit tests for them, you know, what, ha what have you. Right, so, so as I mentioned, um, the evaluation is basically always paralyzed as long as there are no data dependencies between two nodes of the evaluation. And so what that means, again, is that inside a reflow, you're just writing straightforward code. It looks like it's serial in any other context, but it's in fact can be paralyzed underneath the, the hood. All the computations, uh, again, because reflow controls the concrete syntax and, and understands the precise dependencies between all the computations, it can cache everything that it computes and retrieve that from cache if it's been computed before. And so, for example, if I have uh, an align, if I've done an alignment and then do some computation on that alignment, and I do a different computation on the same alignment, uh, Reflow will simply just retrieve the cache results, and it'll go much faster. <coughs> Reflow itself is lazily evaluated, meaning that uh, something is computed only if it's actually needed inside of an execution at any any one point. And what this means is that uh, you have. Uh, I, I would say this enhances the ability to reason about your code and also composability. So for example, if I have um, uh, this alignment uh, uh, situation, for example, and I pass in this reference that might be really expensive to compute for some reason, maybe I'm computing the reference from scratch instead of using one that's been computed for me, well, by passing that in, I'm not actually computing it, right? It's only being used if it, if it, if it gets used at the end of the day. Uh, and so that's sort of one example where where that helps, um, helps out a lot. And the net effect of this is that uh, the combination of the sort of lazy evaluation together with memoization, uh, together with data flow semantics, is that reflow is fully incremental. And so if you compute something, uh, reflow is guaranteed to compute the smallest difference that is required to update your results from what's previously been computed. And this is all sorts of interesting benefits as we'll get into in a second. So here's an example, uh, uh, just sort of demonstrating uh, the value of incremental computation. And again, I'm uh, abstracting the actual code, but let's just say that everything here is expensive to compute. Um, so it's sort of standard uh, you know, data processing pipeline, might have a cleanup step, uh, some sort of analysis step. Uh, it might merge multiple analyses together. Um, and uh, that's what this represents, so in this case, uh, I might have a set of samples. In our case, it might be a, a set of different uh, you know, uh, sequencing samples that we have. And I want to perform the cleanup on all the samples. I want to analyze them all. And then finally, I want to merge all the analyzed samples into some, uh, you know, some um, uh, common data structure uh, that allows me to, for example, do some sort of population analysis. So what incremental evaluation, evaluation gives us is very interesting. So for example, let's say I have this setup and I change my analysis. Well, Reflow will recompute all the analysis for all the samples and then the merge, right? But not the cleanup. If I add a sample to my population, which is very common, it'll compute the cleanup and analyze step just for that added sample and then remerge everything, right? Um, and, and so on and so forth. So you can kind of see where this goes, right? It's able to kind of compute the smallest thing that it needs to compute in order to give you what it is that you asked for. Uh, and that's a very, very useful um, uh, property of these sorts of systems. So in terms of runtime, so uh, Reflow does not actually depend on any sort of external components except access to, C, uh, to say the EC2 API. Um, it does not use an external cluster manager or anything like that. It computes directly on, on the cloud, if you will. In the examples that I showed you, uh, the evaluator itself, you know, in this case, just ran on, 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 on my laptop, right? Uh, and again, uh, it was able to instantiate workers, uh, perhaps across multiple uh, EC2 nodes, um, and make resource allocations inside each of these workers. It maintains a cache, in this case an S3, right? Uh, but that's an implementation detail that's hidden behind a fairly simple interface that can be implemented in multiple different ways. And so we have an S3 implementation, but we also have a file system implementation and a few, you know, few others. Um, uh, and that's sort of the, 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 the gist of that. The interesting thing is that uh, while it seems like this is implementing a lot, it's 
effectively sort of implementing parts of a cluster scheduler like Kubernetes, the evaluation semantics of reflow allows for a pretty drastic amount of simplification to that, uh, which we take great advantage of. And I'll get into that a little bit as well. So I mentioned that uh, reflow parallelizes work through a work stealing uh, setup. And the way that works is that uh, I have a sort of primary resource allocation where I try to do most of my work. But if this runs out of capacity, in other words, if I'm queuing work, then there's a work stealer that will go and allocate more nodes and um, uh, assign them tasks, basically. Uh, and the way that works is that uh, the, 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 the stealer will transfer all the dependent objects, again, because Reflow tracks all the dependencies precisely. It knows exactly which data are required to compute any given step. It transfers those dependent objects, it computes the work, and then transfers the result back. And this is all done sort of node to node or mediated by S3 depending on the, on the configuration. So one really, really important thing. Uh, so I wanna mention that uh, for all that Reflow does, there's only around 30,000 lines of Go. Uh, and as you know, Go is not the most succinct language, right? And so it's really not that much code. But it goes to great lengths to try to simplify its implementation by sort of exploiting the computing semantics. So my favorite example of that is that because we have caching and referential transparency, fault tolerance is simply just restarting the whole computation. Because if something fails, uh, like a, a node goes down, for example, or is reclaimed because it's a, it's a spot instance in EC2, I can just restart the whole thing and it'll more or less pick up where I left off, right? Because I can just make use of the uh, previously computed results. The evaluator itself is completely stateless because it computes its state. Again, for the same reason, I can, uh, the, the, the entirety of the uh, semantics of the computation is expressed in the concrete syntax that you saw, and there's, there's no external way of influencing that, and so I can always compute the, the internal state, and so I don't need to keep any additional state. Uh, also, we sort of liberally apply the end-to-end -end principle, so for example, uh, the evaluator maintains keep alive to these resource allocations, and if they fail, they just restart it, and so on and so forth. Um, and in practice, that actually works really, really well. We end up with a you know, simple and robust uh, vertical compute stack um, that actually does a lot with very little, uh, again, by kind of exploiting the inherent simplicity of the computing model and not trying to do too much more. So again, I, I sort of went over this again uh, uh, a little bit before, but uh, one thing that's really, really important, I think, the, the sort of main takeaway, I think, uh, is that this combination of features, this lazy evaluation, uh, caching, and so on and so forth, uh, really results in a very simple and sort of uh, computing model that's easy to exploit. Um, and the other sort of interesting part about that is that uh, because of these features, because Reflow is able to do incremental computation and, and so on and so forth, it can also replace a lot of the kind of superstructures around scientific computation. So here's an example. Um, it's often the case that you have uh, a system that deals with like sample management. And so it tracks, here are all the samples, here are all the computations that have been run on these samples, here's the, uh, you know, where the results of those computations reside and so on and so forth. Um, and whenever there's new versions of software out, you know, you have to go and, and kind of reconcile that state with, with the sort of new desired state. Well, in Reflow that's very simple. If I just know my set of samples, I know exactly what it is that I want to compute, which is just my workflow over all those samples, and I can express that directly. And the state itself is computed, and so there's nothing more to do, right? I don't need these sort of superstructures anymore. Um, and, and, and again, because of referential transparency, the runtime itself is given a, a wide latitude in everything from cache management to data movement to uh, you know, retrying operations, uh, trade-off of compute versus storage costs, so you know, one thing that we're starting to do, for example, is to effectively store what the cost of a given object is and then decide you know, whether or not that's worth keeping around or recomputing, because we can always recompute it. Right. And so it gives you a lot of interesting freedom in the runtime. Uh, uh, and again, in the word of, of, of Butler Lampson, we have, I think we've successfully untied the hands of the implementer, i.e. me. Um, so another sort of interesting thing with this is that uh, Reflow gives you perfect reproducibility in the sense that, again, these Reflow programs actually fully describe the computation that you want. 
right? And so looking at, uh, say, versioning a, a workflow or pipeline is as simple as adding a git tag for that version. You can always go back to it. You can compare the results. There are some tools that will tell you sort of what the difference between you know, given git tag is and, and, and the current master and so on and so forth. And so a lot of um, the computing model also gives you a lot of power to build these kinds of tools around it or use existing tools, in this case git, uh, to, to kind of do the, the, the hard work for you. So um, Reflow is now open source as of last month. Uh, it's on you know, github.com, grail bio, Reflow. Uh, and inside of Grail, we now have for almost a year been using, uh, well, I would say half a year, we've been using Reflow for all of our scientific computation, all of our bioinformatics, uh, but also a lot of ad hoc computing. And so uh, we have biostatisticians who have used Reflow uh, to compute uh, really, really expensive noise models using, uh, you know, 20,000 cores on AWS, uh, no, no sweat at all, right, for, for a single computation. Uh, a lot of exploratory analyses, so you just want to test the hypothesis really, really quickly. Uh, it's very simple to do with Reflow. Uh, and I think overall, uh, the, the kind of original, original premises have actually held, uh, and uh, the model uh, ends up you know, working really well, and especially caching. And so one thing that we do a lot um, in, in the kind of computation we do at Grail specifically is that we have these pipelines, and they tend to change all the time. But some parts of them are slower moving. Uh, happily, alignment is one of those, which is also one of the more expensive things that we do. And so we're able to iterate really, really quickly, uh, launch new versions of the pipeline all the time, but it ends up being very, very cheap to run because it's, Reflow is able to reuse most of the computation from previous runs, right? Uh, and that's saved us a lot of money and time uh, in, in, in computing. So uh, that's, that's it for my talk. I'm happy to take questions. I encourage you to uh, check it out. Uh, it, uh, it is truly an open source project. Um, uh, we have released binaries. There's a tutorial even. Uh, and uh, it really is as simple as, as I made it out to be in the sense that if you come with some AWS credentials, you can run whatever your AWS account allows for. Uh, you can easily run a thousand node computation uh, in a matter of minutes. Um, and so, uh, so with that, I'll, I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? Uh, this uh, looks pretty cool. Um, a lot of the ideas uh, in this remind me of uh, a lot of the ideas in Basil or Blaze, which I'm pretty sure probably I think you're very familiar with. Um, and so I have a couple questions along those lines. So you say that it's referentially transparent, which is, is cool. How do you manage that without, like, I mean, like the, the standard FP trick to making, like, like side effect things referentially transparent is, of course, like, moments, right? So, like, like you make these objects like that. like, when you say do this thing, how do, are, are you, like, syntactically, like, kind of, uh, like, understanding when these actions are there and they're, like, actions and not, like, an actual file that can be read? So that's kind of one question, and along the same lines, if you look at the difference between, um, so, so Pants, another build system that kind of tries to do some similar things to, to it was a clone of Blaze, um, it allows for like, fully dynamic computations, and there's a lot of argue, arguments in favor of that. Uh, uh, Basil does not allow for that, and there's also arguments in favor of that, for, like querying, it seems like you can do some querying. And so I was wondering kind of where you weigh in on the kind of like, do you allow like fully dynamic graphs to kind of like unwind as they go? And like, what do you think about like the Basil argument against that? And I'll just throw one last thing in, if you want to touch on it, is I'm pretty sure, I'm sure you're right that it's easy to spin up a thousand instances. How do you avoid like spinning too much? Do you have a giant computation? Like, what about garbage collection? What about like just like breaking the bank? So yep. Those are my questions. So, so, so uh, let me uh, go in reverse chronological order. Uh, so, <laughs> classic Twitter. Um, so, <laughs> for your last question, uh, uh, Reflow actually does implement garbage collection. And so, uh, it, when a node becomes idle after a certain amount of time, it, Collect, terminates itself, right? And it tries to pack work so that it uh, utilizes the smallest number of nodes, right? It also has file garbage collection, right? Because it can track files precisely. And so once something is uploaded to cache and is guaranteed not to be needed anymore, it can, it can ditch it, right? Uh, 
Uh, and so it uh, does both you know, garbage collection, both of data and compute nodes. Um, I think the previous question was uh, dynamic graphs versus static ones. Or no, uh, how do you avoid spinning up a, a thousand nodes? Well, we have limits built in. And so you can't at least accidentally do it, right? Um, uh, in terms of dynamic versus static, uh, reflow is fully dynamic. So you, you actually saw this with the split fast queue or the, the splitting example. We don't know how many splits are going to be up ahead of time, right? And we can compute those inside our reflow. Um, for the kinds of workloads that we do with Reflow, dynamism is absolutely required. Uh, it just, because there are a lot of things that depend on the data, depend on data sizes, depend on a lot of things like that, um, that, that you want to be able to exploit. In terms of a build system, um, I, I, I'm not as well versed in, 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 in that domain, but I could see an argument for making it more static simply because the domain is more constrained and compilers tend to behave in fairly static ways. Like, Usually, you don't have to determine which modules to compile based on the output of some other compilation step, right? Because you have static type checking and all these different things. Um, the first question was. I've lost track. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, let, let's catch up after. Yeah. Let's do yeah. Okay. Um, thanks a lot for this talk. Um, I guess this dovetails a little with uh, maybe what was the first question, which was it sounds like a lot of the complexity is in the caching. So when you cache something, you have to know exactly what the version of the data is feeding into the version of the function, which uh, Docker images are used to execute it, and all of that. How much state is that, and how do you manage that in such a dynamic environment? So, so it can be fully, so the, the cache key can again be fully computed uh, without any state. And uh, it's because we control the concrete syntax, and we can do enough analysis over that AST Right, so you can't have another programming language influence. No, but right. there's a state of all the artifacts and programs and data yeah, source. Those are, those, those are expressed directly in the program, right? So for example, your Docker image is expressed in the program. Um, the input data are expressed. Uh, when, uh, so, so here's an example, right? So let's say, let's say I cache one of these alignments, right? The cache key for that alignment comprises the, the digest, the SHA-256 of all the input files. Um, the, the resolved, you know, Docker image, uh, you know, and it, it, it can track precisely how to reconstruct that environment, right? And that's the key that's used to cache it, right? And so it is precise, and in fact, uh, one, of the, one of the problems that we have in practice is that it's overly precise. So, you know, if you change the character in your command, right, it's going to invalidate the cache key. And so we're now starting to come up with ways to kind of modulate or, or give a little bit of control to users in terms of, of caching as well. But by default, it's, it's precise, yeah. All right, uh, actually, right. Uh, time's <laughs> yeah. up for this I'm session. We're ha I'm happy to, I'll, I'll be uh, you know, in the corner over there, happy to, to, to chat, yeah. So thanks a lot, appreciate it.